remember the theme verse for this series was Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Amen? I'll give you, are you tired? Is life really just kind of wore you out? Come unto me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The key point being come. Come to the Lord. He'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So we've found 16 different ways to come to him. Well, today, I'm all the way down to the last one. This was in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14 through 17. And can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? <laughs> You've been misunderstanding something for a long time. You've been mis misunderstanding something, and I'm going to help you out today. And they all said, here's what you've been misunderstanding, and I'll share it with you in just a moment. It says, uh, we're not going to be anxious because Jesus has been sanctified in our heart. But even if you suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Even if you suffer for what is right, you are blessed. And the word blessed obviously means I stand in the presence of God and good things are coming into my life, but there's a very strong connotation of happy. You are happy. Even if you suffer for what is right, you're happy. So we got this happy person going through suffering, but they're still happy because their happiness, their peace, has been secured by the blessings of God. Do not fear their terror and do not be terrorized. Now, I read that in many different translations and I translated it myself. The actual word behind terror there, translated many different ways, is phobia. Do not have phobia over their phobia. Do not let them terrorize you with their terror. Now, here's the verse you've been misunderstanding. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Now, I was always taught from a young age that what Peter was talking about is always be ready to witness when you get a shot at it. But he said, remember, do not fear the terror that they're going to terrorize you with. Instead of being afraid, set apart in your hearts Christ as Lord. And be ready, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asked for the hope that you have. So you see when he said be ready to give an answer. He's talking about in the context of being attacked. Hello? When you are being attacked verbally. And you're being criticized and slandered. Instead of getting all tore up about it. He said separate Jesus. Sanctify Christ in your hearts. And get ready to give an answer. Get ready to give an answer for those who ask concerning the hope that is in you. But do this with gentleness and respect. Well, there went all the fun, right? Because when I'm getting attacked, that's the last thing I think of is gentleness and respect. Can I get a witness? Right? You want to say things like up your nose with a rubber hose. You know, you're ugly and your mom dresses you funny. Or, you know, you just want to come back. Those are the mild ones. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if God's will, if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now, what he's saying here, that there is going to be an enemy of our peace. And that enemy is going to be terror inflicted upon us by those who want to terrorize us. And the passage here is challenging for me. It's, it's one of those things. How many of you love general concepts and vague statements? What do we always say? When my wife was talking to me about something, I say, give me an example. What are you, what are you talking about? I need something specific. And Peter just gives us general concepts. And so I'm struggling to say, Peter, what do you mean? What do you mean? 
Do not be terrorized by their terror and be ready to make them ashamed when they attack me. Would you give me some examples of that? Let me know what you mean by that. There are people who can terrify you. I said, there are people who can terrify you. You're not following me. There are people who can terrify you. And we are told to protect ourselves and our peace from those people. Do you think about that for a moment? I know it's early and you've only had two or three cups of coffee. Think about that. For a there are people who can destroy your peace. And Peter says, don't let them. <clears throat> Please track with me. We are to move our peace out of reach. Say amen. We are to move our peace out of reach where they can't reach it. Sometimes we let people whose advice we would never listen to criticize us to the point where we have no more peace. Come on. We let people who we have no confidence in their advice, but we have all kinds of confidence in their criticism. And that is where we get all tangled up. Is because when I let someone, when you let someone criticize you that is in no position to criticize you, and you internalize those things, phew, there goes your peace. You too deep, too fast. Should I have told a few jokes first? <laughs> you know. So our peace is gone because that we have allowed ourselves to put all kinds of confidence in criticism that other people have had for us. And Peter says, the Holy Spirit says, God says through the apostle, don't let that happen. Elevate your peace to a place where they can't reach it. If I were to put this in context, I might jump to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. He says, live such good lives among the pagans that Though they accuse you. There's some specifics. Though they accuse you of doing wrong. They may see your good deeds and glorify your father on the day he visits us. Live such good lives in the presence. Oh, this is tough. Live such good lives in the presence of people who are accusing you. That when the Holy Spirit visits they will be ashamed of themselves. Live such good lives. Wouldn't you like to have it where when someone says something slanderous about you that people just laugh it off because it's so unbelievable? Hello? I remember one time many years ago in a faraway land with people you don't know will never know um, I was sitting and leading a board meeting. A lady came into the board meeting, and she said, and I'll never forget the premise of it. She said, I have something to say to this board. I said, really? Okay. And she proceeded to tell the board that me, their pastor, was living this gross life or immorality. This double life where I had all this weird stuff going on behind the scenes. I hope you're laughing because I am. <laughs> when she got done, adultery would have been clean. I mean, she just went down all kinds of paths. And I'll never forget, you know, uh, the board got up and said, Sister, we're going to pray for you. And she went, ah! And she took off out the door. But I thought it would be good even though, and I did bust out laughing because it was so ridiculous and so over the top. But, you know, and, and, and the next day I, I gathered the staff together and I said, I just want you guys to know I am being accused of. And they busted out laughing. 
I said, come on, guys, take this serious. And they laughed. They said, it's just so ridiculous. Don't you want to be that? When someone tries to paint filth on you, then people go, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, you know, he might have jaywalked, but that's it, you know. <laughs> Live such good lives that the people, when the Lord shows up, will be embarrassed that they ever said anything bad about you. Live such good lives that you will make it totally ridiculous. Now, we've heard the statement, haven't we? Now, let me, let me establish a few more things before I get into that. First Timothy, excuse me, First Peter 2.23, 2, when they hurled insults at him, Jesus, he did not retaliate. Oh, my goodness. How in the world are we ever going to do that? They're hurling insults at us. And the model Jesus, he doesn't get down on their level and hurl insults back at them. But it's so much fun. But he doesn't hurl them back. So you have insults and slander and, and those kind of things being hurled at you. And the Bible says in that, do not let it terrorize you. Do not let it take your peace away. When people are saying terrible things about you, do not let it destroy your peace. Notice he didn't say, I'm going to shut them up. <laughs> Don't you wish the Lord would just shut them up? You know, but he didn't say, I'm going to. He said, you need to put your peace out of reach. Of that stuff. I grew up hearing like you that sticks and stones may break our bones, but words can never harm them. Later we realize that the greatest harm that can be done is through words. Those are the things that go past the flesh, bruises and cuts heal, but they land in our spirit. They land in our minds. They land in our hearts. I want to say something here. It's not in your notes, but man, this is very tweetable. <laughs> very postable. I know. We will never have peace until we learn to deal biblically with weaponized words used against us. We will never have peace until we learn how to deal biblically with weaponized words used against us. The devil's name is slanderer. Hello? That's his name. Can I tell you something? Can I tell you guys something? <clears throat> Are you sure? Are you ready? Hearts open. You are not your worst moments. You are not your worst moments. Your critics will set up camp at your worst moments, your biggest mistakes, and they'll continually hurl those at you. And you are not your best moments either. <laughs> You're not that good. You just got lucky, you know. You're not your best moments either. You are a co compilation of all of your moments. And years ago, I made a list of, and I, I call it 10 things I hope my kids know before they leave home. 10 things I hope my kids know. I actually turned it into a sermon. I've preached it many times. Some of you parents would like a copy of that. <laughs> 10 things I hope my kids know before they leave home. And one of those was mistakes should be your teacher, not your undertaker. Mistakes should be your teacher, not your undertaker. Why am I saying that? Because... People will take your worst moments and destroy you if you let them. Do not be terrorized by their terror. 
What is so terrorizing? It's when someone perhaps visits or was there, was an eyewitness of your worst moments, and they will never let you forget it. The moment you are about to do something great for God, they're there to say, look at you. Who do you think you are? Look what you did. And you go, oh, you're right. Cancel that. Cancel that step of faith. Cancel that launching out there. Friends, at times, we all need tough love. We need hard truth. We need people to step into our lives and say, I love you, but you're wrong. I love you, but I know you, and you're off track right now. We need tough love and hard truth. We know that the wounds of a friend can be trusted. Say amen. The wounds of a friend can be trusted. But this isn't slander. The wounds of a friend do not leave us feeling worthless. The wounds of a friend do not leave us feeling disqualified for life. That's not the wounds of a friend. The wounds of a friend say, I know you. You can do better than that. I know you. you there's more to you than that. You've got to get a grip on things because God's got better plans for you than what you're doing right now. That junk doesn't belong in your life. Get it out of your life, and God's got something great He wants to do. So you go out saying, I've got to get my act together because God's got a great plan for my life. That's the wounds of a friend. But when you're being buried under your worthless and you're no good and you're irreparable, and that's the end of you. That is not God. That is not the things of God. Tough love leaves us feeling determined to rise up. Weaponized words leave us emotionally bleeding and feeling that we're worthless and unloved. And they all said, I put a video on my Facebook feed. I invite you to go look at that sometime. Not now. Major Elliot Chadoff, uh, the Israeli Defense Force. We got to, he he um, took some of us. Was in Israel not long ago. He took some of us to the Lebanon border, and we stood there. And he told us about some things that now this video I posted. It, it's it's gone public. It wasn't public at that time. That Hezbollah is just across the border. You you stand there on the border, and you look across. You see Hezbollah, and uh, this this major was telling us. He said. All those houses used to be Israelis. And when the Israeli Defense Force pulled back, all the settlers left those houses because it wouldn't be safe to stay there. And he said, so Hezbollah brought in Muslim families, put them in those homes with the um, condition that they be allowed to store missiles in the basement and the garages. So he said, we've got houses over there who are full of, that are full of missiles. And he said, our intelligence officers tell us, you know, the last time we had a battle with Hezbollah, over the course of many weeks, um, they fired 2,000 rockets into Israel over the course of weeks. He said, our intelligence says that next time they will fire 2,000 a day from, from that settlement over there. And he said, we just found out it's not public, but if you watch the videos, it is public now that there are tunnels dug under the uh, border and they're coming out into apple orchards where Hezbollah can drop down 20 stories and send troops running across the border underground as a, a force to go out and, and uh, take territory and key points at that time. And he said there's going to be a day uh, at some point, at least this is their plan we know about, when missiles will start raining down from the sky at a rate of about 2,000 a day. Troops, Hezbollah troops, will be coming up out of the ground. And he said at that day, it will be a battle like you've never seen, and it's imminent. It'll be a battle like you've never seen, because he said, we won't fight that battle twice. He said, we've already told them, when they attack, we will get rid of them and Iran. That's behind Hezbollah. Now, the reason I t said that is because, imagine this, enemy coming up from the ground and rockets coming down from the sky. <laughs> Do you ever feel like you were there? Do you ever feel like you look around and go, 
that's an apple tree. No, that's a soldier, <laughs> you know, and, and the enemy's coming up and the enemy's coming down and there's all kinds of battle going around, around you. And just let me share with you this great news that if you haven't been in those chapters, they're coming. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Glory to God. If you haven't been there, you will be there. Where you feel like the enemy has dug tunnels under your life and he's coming up from below and he's lobbing missiles down on your head. And that's, see, if you understand that, then the sermon will make sense today. How to defeat a verbal terror attack. Now, you ready to take some notes? Are you ready to take some notes? All right. First of all, sanctify Jesus in your heart. Sanctify Jesus in your heart. Sanctify, it's the Greek word hagioth, where we get the word holy. Set apart, separate, and elevate. When I sanctify Jesus in my heart, <clears throat> I go into my heart and I pull Jesus out of the mess that is everything else going on in my life. There's all this noise and all this junk, but I reach in there and I get Jesus and I elevate him above everything. And now Jesus is above the mess. He's above the battle. He's, he's up there holy and separate and elevated above everything else. And when Jesus is separated and elevated from everything else, we're ready to deal with the attacks. We're ready to deal righteously with the attack. But you see, a mind that has not sanctified Jesus will respond to attacks in the flesh. That went right over, didn't it? I'm going to say it again. A mind that has not sanctified Jesus will respond to attacks in the flesh. If you're not prayed up, you'll be heading to work Monday morning in rush hour traffic, acting just as much like a moron as everybody else. And they all said, if you're not sanctified, if Christ hasn't been sanctified in your mind, when someone starts picking on you, you'll respond in the flesh. And it'll be impossible to tell the good guy from the bad guy. Hello? It'll be impossible to tell the righteous from the unrighteous because everybody's unrighteous when we start responding in the flesh. A mind that has sanctified Jesus will look to him for leadership when the attack begins. I'm being attacked, the incoming, they're coming up from below, they're coming up from above, and instead of going, all right, you filthy, ugly, and instead of doing that, you rise up and you say, okay, Lord, what's the plan? How do I deal with this attack? What do I do with this enemy? How do I respond to this enemy? That happens when you sanctify Jesus. A sinful attack on one part, person's part often leads to a waylay of sin from the other person. And so before you know it, you've got these two people, maybe both of them are believers, maybe just one of them believers, but they're acting as, as sinful as, as anybody ever could be because they're not, Jesus has not been sanctified. You see, here's something else tweetable. When Jesus is sanctified in our minds, we do not respond to the attacker. We respond to our Lord. We do not respond to the attacker. We respond to our Lord. So someone comes at us with slander and hurtful things to tear us down, to take away our peace to ruin us and make us miserable. But instead of responding to that person, we respond to Jesus. Jesus, what do you want me to do about this? See? This is good stuff. I mean, even though you're not enjoying it, I am. Lord, what do I do about this attack? What do I do about this unfair criticism? What do I do about this slander? 
God, what do I do about this stuff that is under the blood that this person is bringing up and throwing in my face? What do I do about it? I'm responding to my Lord and not to my attacker. Ah, isn't that good? I'm responding to my Lord and not to my attacker. That's why I have to sanctify Jesus in my heart. As long as Jesus is just part of the mess, we'll never have peace. We have to make him Lord of all. Any of you watched the basketball games yesterday? Anybody rooting for Texas Tech? <laughs> yeah. Um, there were a few guys on the court that every time they would say something, everybody would do what they told them to do. Often it was preceded by whistleblowing. And so the, the game would be going, people would be pushing and shoving and shooting, and all of a sudden the whistle, everybody would stop and say, what? And they'd say, he's going to shoot free throws, or he's going to do this, or you're going to get the ball over here. Because you see, the referee has been sanctified on the floor. And he calls the shots. The problem with our conflicts is that we make Jesus just one of the players when he is the referee. He's the one that says, stop it, stop. He's the one that changes things. Number two, prepare to respond righteously. Always be what? <laughs> we'll do that again. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that is in you. But do this with gentleness and respect. Did you notice that the response flows out of preparation? Most responses in times of conflict have no righteous preparation. And the reason we don't respond well is that we have not prepared well. Come on. The reason we don't respond well to that attack is that we haven't prepared for that attack. When we are not prepared righteously, we will respond unrighteously. Hello. <laughs> When we have not prepared ourselves to say, Lord, what am I going to do in the time of conflict? There are people who say, you never know until you're in the battle what you will do. What if our military operated like that? What if we gathered up a bunch of 18 and 19 year olds, sent them to the battlefield and say, let's see what you guys do. We don't. We prepare them. And how many times have I talked to some military person when they've come back from the battlefield and they'll say, man, how do you, how do, you do that? I, I can imagine being there and people shooting at me and, and, and hurting the people I'm there with. I, can't, you know, I don't know what I would do in that situation. And they say, I'll tell you what you'd do. Your training would kick in. Your training would kick in. Your preparation would kick in. And when you didn't know what to do, you would do what you were trained to do. Godly preparation requires that we arm ourselves with the attitude of Christ. 1 Peter 4, 1. We're in 1 Peter. Since Christ suffered in the body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, the same spirit, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. The televangelist will never tell you this, but suffering is tends to purify us it tends to filter out the junk prepare yourself arm yourself with the attitude of christ and say this you hear me say this so much and i apologize for the redundancy i'm not getting seen now i'm just trying to get you to get it the righteous people of god the, the people who influence other people for God, there's one thing they all have in common is they suffer well. They suffer well. 
When they go through something, they hang on to God and they get through it. And we're always baffled. I'm always baffled when I see someone who's going through a terrible time and their faith is failing them and they go, I don't know if I can continue on. God didn't keep his... And I go, what, what Bible have you, have you been reading? This Bible tells us to prepare to suffer. To prepare to be attacked. To prepare to be persecuted. Prepare to be slandered. Prepare to have people say all manner of evil against you falsely. Prepare for those things. And when they happen, you hang on and say, yep, I knew this was going to happen. Now we're going on. Wait for the divine opportunity. Be prepared to speak when they're prepared to listen. There's verbal battles going on. And so often when those verbal battles go on, basically, have you ever listened to people argue before? Have you ever listened to you argue before? When we argue with people we love, say, our, any, any of you married people argue? Any of you? Yeah. Basically, what an argument between spouses or people who care about it usually winds up being is a time when you both talk at the same time, and say really nothing. You know? You're, saying, you're making your point, he's making his point, it's going like this, and nobody's listening. And when you do take a breath, it's just to reload. It's not to think things through. It's not to go, well, maybe you've got a point. It's to go, let me see, what can I come back with next that will hurt you? Prepare. To respond righteously. Honor the Lord. He said with your responses. Responses should contain. Gentleness and respect. Man. That's tough isn't it? You're treating me with. Violence. Verbal violence. And disrespect. And I'm going to come back. With gentleness and respect. You see, what's happening is you are elevating yourself because Jesus has been elevating, and you're saying, I'm not going to get down in the mud with you. You see, when you wallow in the mud with pigs, <laughs> you both get muddy, and they like it. Look how out of place this is. You're being terrorized. You're being slandered. You're being insulted. And you are being gentle and respectful. It's because you are not responding to your attacker. You're responding to your God. One of the most difficult lessons to learn in my life, and probably yours, is that the sins of my attacker do not justify my sins. The sins of my attacker does not justify my sins. Again, 1 Peter chapter 3, now 9. Do not repay evil for evil or insult for insult. Oh my goodness. But with blessing? How ridiculous is this? Because to this you were called that you may inherit a blessing. Wow. Do not return evil for evil, insult for insult, but return insult with blessing. Imagine this. Will you with me? It's a fantasy, but imagine it with me. Someone is speaking ill to you, hurtful things to you, and you've got a load of ammo that you can pump right back at them, you know. But instead, you just pause and say, Lord, help this person. Bless this person. He's lost. She's lost. She doesn't understand your ways. And he says, bless them. That doesn't mean we're condoning what they're doing. It means that we are elevating the battle because we do not war against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. Those spiritual forces that are operating in the, in the attacker want me to get down on that level. They want me to throw a cussing fit. Those spiritual forces want to break me down. 
and take away my joy. Is this meaning anything to anybody here? Number three, make sure you provide a righteous contrast. He said, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Provide a righteous contrast. Their being sinful, you're being righteous. And what a contrast. Come on, what a contrast. They're taking the low road, you're taking the high road. What a contrast. Would you be honest enough to admit that many times you leave the battle having a whole lot to repent of? Say, well, Lord, I said and did some things that you can't be happy with. Let's talk about how I can get that covered <laughs> in the blood. But what if we, for a moment, changed our definition of when? I'm winning the battle. If in the battle, I reveal Christ. I'm winning the battle. If in the battle, I show a little bit of who Jesus is. What if, what if I change what it means to win? What if I begin to define the battle is I survived the uh, assault on my life and I stood up and I showed Jesus under fire. I would suggest to you that that would be the ultimate loss for the enemy. He came at you with every ugly, unkind, hurtful thing he could. God protected you and you stood up. And you refused to go down into the mud. This, he says, brings shame to the attacker. Brings shame to the attacker. Number four, carefully choose your reason to suffer. It is better if it's God's will to suffer for good than for doing evil. For doing good than doing evil. Now, A or B, suffer for doing good, or B, suffer for doing evil. Which do you choose? I'll take C, no suffering. Well, the, the TV evangelist told me I could have C. If I just had faith, I wouldn't have to suffer. So, But Peter doesn't give you C. He says, hey, life's going to be very painful at times. And you're going to go through some tough stuff at times. You'll either suffer for evil or you'll suffer for righteousness. Pick one. What are you going to pick? Let's pick righteousness. Let's pick righteousness. In the next chapter, Peter will say this. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering. Ooh. As though some strange thing were happening to you. Man, do we need that or not? <clears throat> do not be surprised at the thing you're suffering as though something strange is happening. But rejoice that you... What? Rejoice. Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ... You're blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Think about that for a moment. Be overjoyed, because when you suffer for Jesus, you're blessed. And the glory of God is increasing in you. I want to kind of piggyback on something I said last week. Do you remember? I said 
The idea of an angry God is not marketable. But if God did not save us from wrath, salvation is no big deal. It's no big deal. If I wasn't saved from eternal hell, salvation, why did he even bother dying on a cross? But the fact that I was saved from the wrath of God says that salvation is great. It's wonderful. I don't have to live in fear of God's wrath because the wrath has been satisfied through Christ and I've, I've put my faith. I put my faith in Christ. Here's where I want to piggyback. If this life is almost heaven, heaven's not that big a deal. I mean, I know I complain about it, but the reason I do is because I'm afraid some of you guys that I'm responsible for are going to get sucked into it. When I turn on my TV and, and I watch the TV evangelists and I see the, evan the preachers at the megachurch, I get the distinct feeling that I can make this life almost heaven. I can have a mansion. <laughs> I can have all the stuff I want and I don't ever have to get sick anymore. I don't ever have to suffer anymore. All I have to do is have faith, and I can make my life almost heaven. And if this life can ever be almost heaven, heaven's not that big a deal. But if heaven is so great, at least in part, because there will be no more suffering, then heaven is great. Heaven is great. <clears throat> Had a series of meetings one time with a group of professional people, and one of the guys in the group was a lawyer, a Christian lawyer. I know you think that's an oxymoron. But I sat next to him at the Big Biscuit one time. Any of you ever eaten at the Big Biscuit? Um, and he said, you're a pastor. And I said, yeah. And I started talking. He said, I'm a, I'm a believer. And we were talking. I said, well, tell me about your practice. And he said, well, I'm into estate planning now. But he said, for years I was a divorce attorney. And he said, I was miserable. He said, constantly being involved in that and the brokenness and the devastation of that event, no matter how much money I made, it was a miserable life to live. Plus, he said, there was that passage that, that no man put asunder <laughs> that haunted me because my job was putting asunder, you know. Aren't you glad that God has taken this to a place where there will be no more broken relationships. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that God has taken us to a place where there will be no more devastation, there will be no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more brokenness. Heaven's a really big deal, at least in part because earth is tough. Paul said, if in this life only I have hope in Christ, I'm of all men most miserable. Because he said, this life has been very difficult. So, what are Peter's closing words to us here? Dear friends, don't be surprised when painful trials come your way as though something weird happened to you. No. But rejoice that you're able to participate and the sufferings of Christ. So that when his glory is revealed. The spirit of glory. And the spirit of God will rest. Upon you. Well. I've just finished a 16 week series. And it breaks my heart. You will never 
have peace until you learn to deal biblically with words that have been weaponized against you. You got to take your peace and put it out of reach so that those who want to terrorize you with their terror can't get to it. Hello? Can't get to it. You are not your worst moment. You're not your best moment. You're an accumulation of all your moments. And sometimes you just have to close the door on all the past moments and look to the future moments because the past doesn't look that good. But your Heavenly Father says, come on. If the past haunts you, I've got a future that will make you forget about it. Hello? That's who God is in your life. Gosh, I sure hope that I have not spent 16 weeks just making noise that this congregation has moved deeper into the peace of God. Come unto me, all you who are laboring and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Amen. Bow your heads with me, please. I'm speaking to some precious daughters and sons. I see in my spirit that your heart is bleeding. You are wounded and you're bruised, maybe even crippled. Words have been weaponized. And there's not much left of you. I have a prophetic word for you, really short, but absolutely true, from your father. I love you anyway. I love you anyway. I love you anyway. I saw it all. I was there for your worst moments. And I love you anyway. And if I and close the door on it. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. I love you anyway. Listen. I love you anyway. I died for you knowing your worst moments. And I loved you anyway. Now take your peace and put it out of reach of hateful people, graceless people. Take your peace and hide it deep where they can't reach it. And when the enemy comes up from below and falls from above, look to me. I'll lead you to victory. Because I love you anyway. I'm going to ask everyone to stand with me, please, everyone. I never plan how services end. I really just try to say, Lord, what do you want to do? So here's what I think the Lord is saying. Somewhere around you, maybe beside you, in front of you, to your right or to your left.
there's a precious son or daughter that is feeling crushed under the weight of unkind things. Would it make you feel too awkward? Just reach over and put your hand on the person beside you. If the Lord impresses you on the front of you or whatever, just, and let's just pray for one another. Help your daughter believe, Lord, that you love her anyway. That you love her anyway. You have not learned enough yet, <laughs> and you never will, where you consider this person disposable. Holy Spirit, will you please just whisper into her heart right now, I love you anyway. Lord, there is that son of yours who would give anything to remove part of the history of the past. But you can't. Will you help him, Lord? Help him here. Son, I love you anyway. And nothing will ever change that. I love you anyway. Thank you, Father. I love you anyway. Hallelujah. Sometimes I just have a feeling that I should ask you to go home, take some lipstick, because if you're a single guy, you shouldn't have lipstick. <laughs> take some lipstick right on your bathroom mirror or something, and this would be one of those times. So that every morning for the next several days, you see, I love you anyway. You need to hear that. I really... I don't remember the last time I felt like I just had to park on something and say, you got to believe this. Your peace of mind depends on it. Your peace depends on it. You've got to know how much God loves you anyway. And that anyway means God looks at all of it, sees all of it, knows all of it, and he still says you're to die for. So write that somewhere on the sun visor of your automobile, on the lips, uh, lipstick on the mirror, uh, in your bathroom. When you get up in the morning, you walk in, you see it. God loves me anyway. He loves me anyway. Amen? And he wants you to come and be a part of him. I want to pray a prayer with you real quickly, and I'm going to let you go. Lord, I ask if there's even one person here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, give him, give her the faith, to believe in their heart that you died for every sin they have ever committed, they will ever commit. <coughs> and help them, Lord, to put their faith in you, not in their works. They don't even help them to know they can't even make up for any sins. But, Lord, help them just to put their faith in you and say, Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. And to know that you are forgiving them and you're writing their name down in your book. Thank you, Father for saving them through the blood of Jesus. In your precious name, amen.